Hello and welcome to In Control, the first podcast on control theory. Here we discuss the science of feedback, decision making, artificial intelligence, and much more. I'm your host, Alberto Padoan, live from a recording studio in Zurich. Quick thanks to our sponsors, the National Center of Competence in Research on Dependable Ubiquitous Automation, International Federation of Automatic Control, and the IEEE Control Systems Society. Our guest today is Brian Douglas, Principal Technical Marketing Manager at MathWorks and founder of Engineering Media. Welcome to the show, Brian. Thanks, Alberto. Thanks for having me. Well, Brian, you're uh, arguably one of the most well-known and talented control communicators out there. You have a very popular YouTube channel with approximately, I believe, 300,000 subscribers, millions of visualizations. You famously authored the map of control theory that we are going to talk about also later in this episode. I'd like to start with a very basic question. So uh, what got you into control? Oh yeah, that's, that's actually a pretty easy question to answer. It was uh, during my undergraduate studies at Embry-Riddle, Boeing came to have a job fair and I applied to be an intern at Boeing in California. And we were being interviewed for just general intern, you know, and they were gonna place us in different groups. And I ended up getting the job. And I think it was because I told the recruiter that I liked differential equations, which was my favorite class at the time, that he put me in a controls group and I had no idea at the time what <laughs> controls was. I thought, because this was a uh, spacecraft, that we were working on a spacecraft, and I thought I was going to be working on the ground station, sending like command and control, you know, commands up to the spacecraft to, to, you know, to schedule it to do various maneuvers and things like that. Before I showed up, I had no idea what it was. And it was over the course of that eight months where I learned kind of an introduction into controls and control theory and worked with a bunch of people. And at the end of that eight months, I thought I said, you know, this is what I want to do. This is interesting. So it, I had no idea what it was ahead of time. It was never a goal. Very cool. So you actually learned on the field, basically. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't. Yes, I wouldn't say I learned on the field. I mean, I learned some things, but it was very specialized. And okay. so it was. We were building these massive system models, and so my job was just to sort of run some scenarios and compare it against real world data and just so I, I didn't walk away as a controls engineer i just walked away with a love for controls and then i went back and i took a controls class in undergrad and then many years down the line i ended up getting my master's degrees in dynamics and controls but that's where i first learned about it and met a lot of really interesting people in the field and got excited that this was actually a job opportunity like a, a something that i could do i had because it didn't even cross my mind ahead of time because i didn't know anything about it. Yeah, I guess control engineering is not something that one thinks about normally when you get into engineering and then it definitely crosses people's paths and then it's easy to get captured by this field. I was wondering, so then you actually, at some point you actually ended up working at Boeing. So was it after your studies that you directly joined Boeing and then ended up also at Planetary Resources? I was looking a bit at your path. So you were always a bit, I don't know, it seems at least inspired by space and aeronautical applications. Uh, yeah, you've, you've got that right. I did a, a couple of internships during my undergrad at Boeing. And e eventually I got into, I mean, I was in space from the very beginning, but I really, I went to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University for my undergrad, and I was fully committed to being an aerodynamicist. I wanted to do low speed aerodynamics, really, you know, maybe high altitude, low speed stuff, and just super efficient. Like that's what I wanted to do. And again, I applied at Boeing and it was an airplane company. <laughs> um, but again, I got put on a space program and I'd always had some sort of passing interest in space. I liked it. And, and, but it just sort of grew from there. It kind of lucked, I, I sort of lucked into, into space and controls, but I ended up spending 10 years at Boeing designing guidance, nav and control systems for spacecraft, some really, really large, for the majority of that, it was on their CubeSat program. So CubeSat is like, it's 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters is one unit. And we were building six unit ones. So you can imagine that's like a small suitcase is about the size that we were building 
And then my wife and I wanted to move away from California and up to Washington State. They don't do a whole lot of space up here. So I ended up spending one year um, actually on aircraft designing uh, primary flight controls for the, the 747 and spent about a year on that. I didn't really like it quite as much. And so I ended up leaving Boeing, joining a small space startup called Planetary Resources. We were building spacecraft with the ultimate goal of mining asteroids. Step, well, not really step one. It was like step five was to extract water from these near-Earth asteroids so that we could break it up into hydrogen and oxygen. You've got fuel in space. Water is also good as an insulator for against radiation. There's a lot of good uses for sourcing water in space for space applications. But the first thing we were doing is just building our avionics stack, our software, our GNC system, all of our sensors, all of our actuators, so that we had this platform that we could eventually go into deep space with and go to these asteroids. And we were building them in a low earth orbiting satellite. So I spent five years leading the GNC team and then the systems engineering team for that. Uh, Amazing. So it's been space, space up until that point. <laughs> now, because I also see it throughout also your educational content, that there's always here and there a bit of spacecraft examples, of course, not just that, but I find it a very nice application also of many control ideas and an, a nice way to illustrate controlled concepts. I remember also following this planetary resources company whose goal was like to expand Earth's natural resources base. I found it super fascinating. I wonder at what stage are we in like space mining? Because I found it very fascinating as a human endeavor. Where we are, at least with planetary resources, is that company ran out of money and folded. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so that'll give you a bit of an indication of where we are. But in situ resource utilization, which is extracting resources where you are and using them where you are, is a certainty in space. Companies are pursuing that now mostly for where they're going, which is the moon. And we're looking at it for Mars. And so it, it's a certainty. It's going down the line. It's just too inefficient to have to bring all of your materials with you wherever you're going. If you're going to go somewhere, and especially if you want to stay for an extended period of time. So that's a given. The problem with asteroids is they're hard. And more often than not, the asteroid isn't the destination. It's not like we're going to the moon or the Mars when we want to set up something. Asteroids are, other than scientific you know, research laboratories, which they're great for, they're resource hubs where we can go and, and collect some stuff that we need. And so because of that, you have to develop all of that technology to get there and to extract it. It's not for free. And then what I mean by that is like, we're going to go to the moon or we're going to go to Mars regardless. And so adding another step on that and extracting resources from the moon or the Mars makes sense because it's a small delta to this already existing program. And it's a little bit harder with asteroids in that regard. Asteroids are nice because there's a lot of hydrated minerals on them. So there's a lot of water that can be extracted, but it turns out now that there's, you know, a lot of water on the moon in the poles. And so... I don't know where we are with asteroid mining. I still envision at some far future, we're going to be doing it because it just makes sense if we have a presence in space. I don't know if we're any closer to that particular goal than we were five or 10 years ago. So now, how do we go from working at Boeing and working on spacecraft applications to making the most popular videos on YouTube about controls? How does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> Purely by accident. Every, this is going to be a common theme throughout this talk, I think, uh, Alberto, is that most everything I've done has been purely by accident. I have no, I have no long-term goals. Well, we're glad it happened, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's um, you know, from a controls perspective, it's nice not having a set point because then your error is always nothing. And so that's what I'm doing, just sort of randomly walking through life. So... I told you I, I spent the first 10 years doing satellite control in California and everything that we had worked on was state space based. Okay. And I thought I had a pretty good handle on that. I took a classical controls frequency based course in my undergrad one semester of that, but I didn't really touch on any of it in my master's. Everything was state space. And so I left 
Southern California, I left spacecraft and joined uh, up in Washington where I was doing, like I said, primary flight controls for aircraft and everything there was frequency based. And I knew nothing. And I thought I have 10 years of experience and they hired me because of my experience. And I am worse than a junior engineer because I have all of these bad habits almost from, you know, all of my time domain methods and I don't know what's going on. And I lucked out, I sat next to a guy, his name was Monty Evans, and he was the primary flight controls guy for the 777 and had been there for a long time, brilliant controls engineer. And he sat right next to me and he would just talk to me about catching me up. And he would, he'd write something on a piece of paper and he'd say, yeah, I think it's kind of strange that people don't know what a washout filter is. And then he'd write some transfer function. And I was thinking to myself, oh, wait, I've never even heard of a washout filter. Um, and, and the, you know, the concept, have you, have you heard of a washout filter? I'm not sure how ubiquitous it is. Actually, no. And, but I am kind of familiar with the sensations that you're describing. So I'm, I did also study some frequency domain methods when I was at Cambridge, but even with some researchers, I do have conversations these days where they start in a state space world and they actually never encounter frequency domain methods, which is kind of crazy because they do actually give lots of intuition about what we're doing, basically. They're fantastic. In fact, I'm going to get back to my story, but there's a lot of things that we learn and I still put into my videos that I never use in industry ever, but I put them in my videos because they give you a good intuition into what's happening. And so you may never use that technique, but now you understand a little bit better what is happening. And when you are using the tools, you know, using, you know, MATLAB or Simulink or Python or something like that, now you just have some better intuition into what's happening behind the scenes, even if you're never going to do it. But anyway, a washout filter is a high pass filter, okay. but it's a very special kind. It's a very simple one where the DC term, the zero frequency term, there's no pass through there. It's zero. Okay. And so eventually any steady state or zero term will go to zero. It's not just attenuated, but it's actually eventually removed. And so like a simple one is like a transfer function of S over S plus D, where D is some, you know, cutoff frequency. And uh, it's a high pass filter, but it's a very special, simple version of it. And so he would, so Monty would talk to me and he'd give me these explanations, not mathematically. He'd give me these explanations that were just from 30 years of experience. And I really was drawn to that type of explanation. And I always thought to myself when he had explained something to me, I wish I had just been given this introduction to the topic before I dived into the mathematics. And so eventually, like I have a really bad memory for just mathematics and it's hard for me to recall, you know, how to do a, a particular problem or something. But from a reasoning perspective or from a intuitive perspective, if I can wrap my head around something sort of visually, then it sticks with me forever. And so I thought, I'm going to make some videos purely for taking notes. Like it was my note taking at the beginning. Like the very first video is this, I, I just want to capture some of these ideas that I was thinking about or being taught into a video form. And I had no intention of it, it taking off. And I started getting comments on that first video and the second video of like, hey, this is great. Are you going to plan a series? And I was like, well, I wasn't, but I'll, I guess I'll just keep going. And so that's how I got into making these YouTube videos. It was purely on the side, after work, capturing notes of things that I was like interested in or stories that I wanted to tell. It's fantastic because you already touched on many aspects that I'd like to dig into later. Some of which are like a pedagogical nature. Others are, you know, just demonstrating that you're uh, very good at organizing information. It's a very obvious skill that you have. Clearly you make videos, maps, books that are not too complex, easy to access in some way and easy to keep the attention on for longer than, than usual, if you wish, by reading controls. So actually, I, I thought about doing a, a warm up <laughs> uh, about your videos. So which ones do you think are the most watched as a quiz? <laughs> oh, by far, I would say the most watched are the ones that are the most searched for, which is probably PID control. Nailed it and probably uh, Laplace or Fourier. 
Furia, bravissimo. <laughs> One of the things I, I thought, you know, after about a year into this is, oh, it would be so great to get to the point of these big YouTubers like Veritasium or Smarter Every Day or something where they have such a following that they can tell a story about some topic that nobody searches for and nobody even knows about and they're still going to get millions of views and they're going to find value in that story, in that video. And I thought that would be great to get to that point because there are so many things that I think are really interesting topics in controls that people don't search for because they don't know to search for it. They don't know how valuable it is. And it's hard to get people to click on those particular videos because they're not necessarily interested, right? You're going to go through and you're going to see a video on nonlinear system identification, which I know is your specialty. Yeah. And I would say as an undergrad, which are the people that are searching for these answers, they're not going to click on that video, even if they can glean some information from it that will help them with just regular system identification and the, you know, linear system identification and the, the, the pitfalls that you can find yourself in and some simple ways that you can work out of that. And so I was hoping to get to that point because there are so many stories. Some of my favorite videos get so few views that I think are actually helpful and actually interesting. But unfortunately, you know, so much is beholden to the algorithm and the searching that people are doing. And, and I think most of them are students and they're searching for the things that they're learning in school, which is great. And I'm glad that the videos are there and can help them. But I was hoping to be able to influence a little bit some of these other topics that you might not be learning in school, but that will be helpful for you in industry or post studies. Well, in any regard, the response is overwhelmingly positive. It's shown throughout in every comment of your videos. You have huge lists of compliments from all over the place, which really testifies the quality of your endeavors. I mean, I wanted to talk about different things. So one is the question of style. So your style of teaching is hands-on very much. So in a sense, practical, you always try to build some practical intuition. It's narrated and in with a drawing style. And you also illustrate with cartoons as you go about telling a story. And I don't know, I was just wondering how did this style emerge overall? Because it is very unique and it does keep the attention more than other more, say, traditional styles somehow. It's probably not as unique as you think. In fact, my first dozen videos or so were modeled 100% off of Khan Academy and Sal Khan and the way that he told stories where he was doing, you know, explaining mathematical concepts. And he did it with a black background. He does it with handwriting. He does it with some drawings and some images. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is what I want to do. I gravitated towards that type of visual explanation. And so it's 100% copying Sal Khan. I watched a video. He put a video out where he talked about how he makes his videos and what he thinks makes them good. And one of the things he said was that he does it live in real time. He draws while he talks and he repeats the same thing over and over again because he takes longer for him to write it out than it is to say. And he's very natural about it, like he's talking to a student one-on-one. And he said, this is really important because it doesn't feel detached from the student, like it's just a lecture. Now it feels like a conversation where the flaws in your voice, the flaws in the way you explain stuff, the flaws in your writing come out and it feels a little bit more authentic. And I said, great, great, this is awesome. I'm gonna do that. And I was terrible at it. The, I tried for weeks to write and talk and have a coherent train of thought and I just could not do it. And I said, okay, I'm gonna have to fake this. I'm gonna write a script ahead of time. I'm gonna do my drawings separate and then I'm going to edit it together and I'm going to just try my best to sound as natural as I possibly can because I can't copy what Sal does. And I don't recommend this, but if you go and watch my very first video, it's quite bad. It's very <laughs> robotic. It's just the, the voice doesn't line up with the drawings, the <laughs> drawings. I used this dark red on black background quite a lot 
And people are like, I can't even read that. I'm like, yeah, of course you can't. It's, it's a bad choice. And so over the years, my style has evolved as I've learned what I'm good at and what I'm not good at into what it has become now. But it's 100% thanks to Sal Khan and the way that he set up his educational videos that the style has become what it is. What I also like about your style is that you're also very transparent about what you do. There's a video, a dedicated video about how I make control systems lecture videos. Also the book that I hope we're going to talk about later was also done in a very different than usual format. So up to revisions, for example, you were welcoming feedback. You wanted to make it as accessible as possible also in terms of cost. And I think that is also appreciated on the receiver side. Another thing I wanted to talk about is you know, pedagogical nature, because it seems that control academics are not very good at teaching somehow. <laughs> so it seems like we're always breaking into unnecessary math very, very quickly. And then we sort of miss somehow the why. Why are we doing this and why is, it, is this fun? Whereas somehow you always manage to make it very, very clear. So I guess the question is, why do we always break into unnecessary math and what can we do better? Huh. Well, I appreciate that. I can only speak to my background. I've only taken a few controls courses and I haven't been around university. And so my control courses were very much that straight into the mathematics. And if the why was presented, I wasn't a good enough student to pick up on it. It was somehow presented in a way that I, I didn't know. In fact, at the end of my first semester, we started from a plant model so often that if you had given me a plant model and said, make the output meet these performance criteria, I could do it, no problem. And then I got to industry and, and I was like, wait, where do I even start? Um, I don't have a model. I don't even know what I was modeling before necessarily. Like there's, there's a million inputs and a million outputs on this system. Like what? Where do I where do I start? Where's the where's the input and where's the output and how do I get that model and all that? And so that was kind of my experience. I don't know if that's the way it is everywhere. I think there's, you know, lots of good professors that that spend a lot of time focusing on the why and motivating the student to learn. One of the things that I have as an advantage of making YouTube videos rather than actually teaching a, a real course is that I don't have any responsibility for complete coverage of a topic. And so I get to just pick and choose the things that I want to talk about that I find interesting, or I can just set up the problem in a video and I don't have to go through all of the steps because I'm not really trying to produce a controls engineer at the end of the day. I'm trying to get people motivated and interested enough in the ideas that they go off and they put in the hours reading the textbook or going to the lectures and really understanding the material. And so I think they're two separate problems is, is that I get the, to focus on the why and the interesting parts, because that's what I'm choosing to do. Whereas I think a lot of professors want to do a lot of that stuff, but they also have that responsibility of producing control engineers at the end of the day. And there's just a certain amount of criteria they have to get through. And there's a certain amount of math that they have to, you know, pass on to these students. So like I started these videos, hopefully as a something complementary to universities and textbooks and things, because I think videos honestly are a terrible format for really learning a topic because they go at a set speed. And if you don't understand something, you have to pause it and go back 10 seconds versus a textbook where you can sit and, and mull over or a peer reviewed paper, mull over an, an equation for a long time. And you can, you know, take notes and you can really use your brain to understand what's happening. Whereas, you know, videos are a lot more passive. And so I don't think, like, I never wanted to make videos that were trying to really explain a topic. It was just my goal is at the end of the day, I want that, that person who watches this to be excited about that topic, motivated to go learn more, maybe connect the dots to some other information that they've learned in other classes and give them that aha moment of like, oh, this isn't as hard as I thought, or this is a lot more intuitive than I thought. And then go back to the textbook, to the peer reviewed papers, to their homework, to their actual problem in their in the industry with sort of fresh eyes. 
So I don't know, there's a long way to answer your question is there's only so much time that professors get to interact with the students and you want them motivated and you want them to understand why they're learning their thing. But I, since I'm on the outside, I'm not really sure how, what, how best to use that small amount of time between the professor and the student and spending an entire class covering the thing that I cover in a video might be exciting for the students. And they go out and they leave and they say, oh, that was great. I loved that class. And then they go home and they have to work through some sort of problem and they're going to be stumped um, <laughs> because it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily provide enough to get through. So I, I'm not sure what the divide is. It would be nice to for me to, to have my videos be watched before a class or after a class and then the actual mathematics and the actual step-by-step -step instructions for solving these problems are covered in sort of the more traditional way. I think what I get out of this is that basically, as you say, professors and your videos are serving two different objectives and these objectives are complementary with respect to each other. It seems like one cannot go without the other one. But I feel that somehow now the, the new availability, if you want, of YouTube videos is actually facilitating somehow the absorption of certain concepts because we're building intuition maybe a bit faster or better. Actually, this touches on something that I'd like to talk about also later. So where are we going with, if you want, the future of controlled education? There's lots of technological advancements, light boards, of course, YouTube videos, cartoons that I hope we'll, we'll cover as well, blogs, and now also this podcast. Maybe we, before we do that, there's another pedagogical aspect that I wanted to emphasize also that pervades your videos, and it's about interdisciplinarity. So there's this beautiful video that I think it's titled Building Knowledge in an Interdisciplinary World, where you have this hypothesis, and I loved it. I mean, the hypothesis is technology is becoming more interdisciplinary, therefore we need more interdisciplinary knowledge. And I think it's true. It's emphasized throughout our community and also throughout by many educators. So I'm wondering how do we best do that? How do we grow, if you want, the next generation of interdisciplinary engineers? <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that presentation, sort of full disclosure about that presentation is the ask of me was, how do you make your videos and how do you prepare for your videos? <laughs> and I was trying to figure out a way to tie that into something a little bit more general than just how I make my videos. And one of the things that I have to do for those videos is get up to speed really quickly on a topic. At the time, I was making a video every two weeks, and I would say most of the topics I had no direct experience with, especially when they were starting to get outside of my domain, um, like machine learning and even systems engineering and autonomous navigation and things like that. And so I found myself having to sort of crash course, learn a bunch of stuff really quick, <laughs> at least at least at the surface level, so that I could then turn around and tell that story. And so the idea was, well, people have to crash course, learn stuff all the time. And it's not because they're going to be a professional fluid flow engineer. It's because they have to solve this one little problem that just popped up on their particular you know, system that they're designing or building. And, and control engineers, we get this all the time because our domain is inherently interdisciplinary because it goes through electronics and it goes through software and it goes through hardware and sensors and everything, everything that, and, and fluid flow and temperatures, fluctuations and all of that stuff in some way can impact our feedback control loop. And so we have to be aware, even if we're not experts in it, we have to know who to talk to. We have to have that sort of lingo to go off and talk to them and say, well, how does that impact whatever the, the sensor reading so that I can make sure that I account for that in the robustness of my system or something. So we were constantly learning new stuff and not necessarily becoming experts on it. And so I was thinking, why do we need all of that? And it's probably because technology is becoming more interdisciplinary. Like I have that feeling that it is. Um, and that's why I put it as a hypothesis. There's not, this isn't a research paper. 
Um, I did find two papers that showed that the authors in peer-reviewed papers were becoming more interdisciplinary and the number of authors on a paper were becoming larger over time. You know, you can draw a couple conclusions from that. You know, maybe people just need their citations or something, but I chose to believe that it was because the research that we're doing is touching on a lot of fields. And I gave this example in, in that talk about a dishwasher. Like if we were building a dishwasher 100 years ago, the amount of knowledge that you needed was still pretty deep. Like you had to have really deep knowledge in the particular fields, but it was probably not circuit design, not Wi-Fi, maybe not even software, you know, not software, maybe not even manufacturability or, or things like that, that we have today with dishwashers now, just the number of things that go into building them and making them in these modern dishwashers are just, are just a lot more. And so if you're a controls engineer, the potential for interfacing with all of these different groups goes up. And so therefore you have to have this cursory knowledge, if, even if it's not a deep knowledge, cursory knowledge in a lot of these different disciplines, which is something I find interesting about control theory, at least in practice. And so that's what that talk was on is like, how do we get up to speed quickly? And so it just gave me an opportunity to talk about my method for learning, absorbing, choosing what to focus on and what not to, and then ultimately getting to a point where I was confident enough for me, my end goal was to tell a story in a video. But when I was in industry, getting confident enough that I could have confidence in my control system because I understand that peripheral problem at least well enough. And so, so that's, that's the setup of that. But the question you asked is, how do we change education <laughs> um, or, or something along those lines, right? <laughs> yes, it's related to interdisciplinarity. So how do we make our engineers more interdisciplinary? Because I guess, you know, you still have four or five years to train an engineer during university time. So there is a limit to capacity for, for these poor new generations that need to study <laughs> lots of things. And as you say, you need to be able to speak many different languages, essentially, in engineering terms. Yeah, so there's two things along those lines. Uh, one is, it's impossible to predict, I think, what knowledge you're going to need at any given time on any project. <laughs> like, things pop up all the time that you hadn't even considered. You know, they, they, they switched messaging protocols on the communications bus. It's like, oh, I've never even heard of this new one. Let me get up to speed on it, right? We can't teach all of that stuff to students because like you said, they have a limited amount of time. And so to me, it's just setting them up to learn all of those new things and like how to go about it and how to make those decisions as to like how deep to go into a particular topic and make those decisions. And again, I don't, I don't have experience teaching that sort of thing. So I don't have the answer there, but I, I'm comparing and contrasting labs from when I went to school, or at least at my school, to what I see labs look like now today. And I had like an inverted pendulum that was perfect. The sensor had very little noise. The actuator had very little noise. It just did what you wanted. Everything was fast. It had high bandwidth. And what we did essentially was take our PID gains type it in onto a computer over here and then watch the thing work perfectly. And we went, yep, it works. <laughs> All of that theory, it looks great. And I didn't personally get a whole lot out of that because there wasn't problem solving. It was just following the instructions and then showing on hardware that the end result worked. And I look at labs now just from what people talk about and they've got auton small autonomous vehicles and they have quadcopters, and they have all of these other types of platforms that are already more interdisciplinary than what I was using. And they've got sensors that aren't that great, and they have actuators that aren't that great, and they have flimsy little plastic limbs that vibrate and all sorts of stuff that is instantly making them have to solve problems that are outside of the very specific potentially you know, controls problem that they were there to do. And I think just being exposed to that type of environment over and over and over again gets you 
prepared for solving all of those types of problems that you're going to see after you graduate. And it's not necessarily about showing that this PID controller can actually control a quadcopter, but it's about solving all of those peripheral problems that keep cropping up time and time again so that you can get to that end result and see something. And this is fantastic. I could branch off in a million different directions, but I'll try to contain myself. Also, I just wanted to bring up another element about this talk that we continue mentioning, building knowledge in an interdisciplinary world. Of course, there will be links in the description to everything that we mentioned, hopefully. I found very interesting the three principles that you base, you know, building knowledge on. You, you mentioned before that one of the main skills today is actually building knowledge quickly, at least at a cursory level. And uh, these three principles are start broadly, then find examples, and then talk to the experts, which I find brilliant because it seems like a very sound approach to actually at least building cursory knowledge in one of these new languages, applications, or topics. Yeah, to expand on that a little bit, I think, the, I can't remember, I think the example I used was about machine learning. And I had to make a video on machine learning and I just knew what was in sort of pop culture at the time. I hadn't really been exposed to it. And most of the things that I read right off the bat were about different neural network architectures, feed forwards and convolutions and all of these different things, recurring ne neural nets. And I was tempted to just deep dive into all of these neural network architectures and understand the pros and cons and when I would use one versus the other. And I've, I've done that sort of thing in the past. And what I find is that I don't know enough yet to know whether I'm spending my time wisely. I'm going really super deep into one very specific thing. And I don't even know if that's going to help me solve my problem at all. And so I've sort of switched up how I approach learning now, where I just consume as much information as possible. I read as many blog posts and papers and watch videos and I'm not learning hardly anything at that point. What I'm just trying to do is just take in concepts of like, okay, neural networks are a thing and they're this, they're the way that we're capturing our system or our model. Great, moving on. And then here are the training algorithms and here's gradient descent. And I'm just pulling in all of this stuff so that hopefully I can get this really fuzzy big picture of the field. And then I say, okay, I understand how all of these things relate to each other, but I don't know anything about any of this stuff, really. And at that point, it's, that's when I can go off and I can find examples. I want to find like completed projects that people have done or software projects that I can download and run myself or MATLAB examples that I can tweak the parameters of and see the results. Because now if I can, it's especially awesome if I can find an example that's really, really close to my particular problem because somebody's already done the hard work of narrowing in that scope to what I need. More often than not, you find something that's close. But that helps me narrow down this whole fuzzy world, this whole fuzzy <laughs> landscape into a few specific points where I can really start then deep diving. But then after all that said and done, I'm still high likelihood I'm doing the wrong thing. I'm learning the wrong thing. I'm not an expert. I don't have experience in all of this stuff. But I feel like now I've gained enough knowledge that I can ask intelligent questions and I can make sense of the answers. Like if you go too early to an expert, they're going to tell you something and you don't have that baseline to even really understand what that answer is or how to make sense of it. And so I usually try to wait until I've done this full mapping, a few examples, and then I can go seek out somebody who knows, who knows this stuff. And I can say, this is what I'm trying to do. Here's what I'm considering. What are your suggestions? And then they can course correct me and say, you're wasting your time on this thing. You completely ignored this thing, which is super important. And the thing you're doing over here is exactly on, on target. So keep doing that. And then I get that course correction and then I go off and then I can deep dive in those areas and hopefully being able to keep the big picture in mind because I did that sort of broad survey from at the beginning. That's amazing. I mean, I guess the first step is really building a map. So exactly. <laughs> just as you did for control. So it seems like a very good exercise to then actually then try to understand what is the important bit 
And also I like the second, like fiddling to build intuition, basically, somehow, if I understand this correctly. Yeah, it's finding a way to practice and interact with what you just learned, rather than just through reading and, and consumption that way. I do have to say at this point real quick, I went to a conference on controls education a couple of years ago, and I ran into an actual like pedagogical researcher there. <laughs> And we were, we got to talking and she said, this is kind of a wild conference because all of these things that people are coming up with isn't backed by data and research. It feels like I tried this thing and it worked for me. Let me tell you about it. And all I could think was, oh, you're going to love my talk. <laughs> that's essentially all it is. Um, so, so with that in mind, I just wanted to throw that out as a caveat is that everything that I talk about is I tried a thing and it worked for me. And I would love to get more involved in actual pedagogical research and understand more of the data and the psychology of learning and all of that stuff. And I've been on the outside of all of that, but I have tried a few things and I've gotten feedback from people and I've corrected it. And Everything I'm telling you is sort of where I've landed so far in this, uh, you know, feedback process of learning how to teach. I love this. And honestly, I don't even think it's, personally, at least I don't think it's a problem. So science is there to actually make, you know, as a tool to help us make sense of things, as you say, but we're always doing experiments and just trying things, just trying whether it works and the overwhelming response that you received already seems to be positive. So. I don't think it necessarily needs to be backed up by science. Having said this, of course, I think it, exploring this further with science may even further refine or, or bring new light to some of the topics or methods that you have uncovered. I actually had a curiosity before we move on regarding actually the videos themselves. So what was the topic that was most difficult to explain? Most difficult to explain by far, I think, was systems engineering. The whole systems engineering series was so difficult because I learned systems engineering through aerospace. And the terminology and the approach that we took is how I learned it. And the more I got into systems engineering, the more I learned that every field approaches that kind of differently. And not just like different nomenclature, but just the different tools that they use and, and how they approach systems engineering. And so what I was trying to do with that series was, it was for MathWorks, so it had to sort of fall in line with how MathWorks thinks about systems engineering. But that, more than any other series, had sort of more global appeal, I feel like, because you could apply it to just any complex system that somebody is trying to architect, whether it's a aerospace system or software system or a system of like a, you know, of people or something and trying to find a way to come up with examples and come up with an explanation that I felt had value across the board and not just to a very specific industry was really tough for me. And I'm happy with the way that it turned out. And again, I had a lot of experts at MathWorks help review and add to the story, which they contributed immensely to. But I think we got there in the end, but it took some, not actually like drawing it out and stuff, but just to craft a story of in 15 minutes, what is systems engineering and why is it important was quite challenging. So the first comment is, I guess we need to clarify what is systems engineering. Systems engineering, I guess you're referring to one, at least one video that I noted down was why models are essential to digital engineering. It probably falls in that class. I know it because it, it was marked as one of my favorite videos by far that you've made. I made a small list of favorites and this was amazing. Amazing because it uncovered something that I wasn't aware of. And I, I don't know, I was watching it last night and I just got excited and then I went through uh, Wikipedia rampage about SysML and just everything that has to do with systems engineering. So how do we actually architect, I guess, complex systems of any sort 
in every domain, which is kind of incredible as a goal. The other comment was actually my question was on what was the most difficult control video to to explain. Uh, cl clearly, that that's the way I should have interpreted it from the beginning. <laughs> um, well, let's see. Probably the most I got to I got to think about that because there's for me the difficulty comes in finding the story. Usually, sometimes it's difficult to actually animate or tell graphically. But usually it's just coming up with a story or an explanation that hasn't been done before. One of the things I absolutely do not want to do is if I find a video that has a great explanation for a particular topic is I'm not going to make a video because I don't want to muddy the waters with a subpar explanation if an excellent one already exists. And so I spend usually a lot of time, especially on videos like PID control or LQR or state space or these things that people cover quite often is how do I add to that library with meaningful information, with actual value that people are going to find useful? So that's one perspective. The other perspective is whether I know it going in or not. Those are always tough because like, for example, robust control, I don't have a background in robust control. And so that whole series on robust control was quite difficult for me because I felt like it's controls, it's in my wheelhouse. I should be able to come into this video with good explanations and insight and experience, but it's almost no different to me than coming in and talking about machine learning in some regard. And so coming up with, with that type of a story is always hard. A recent one that was that was actually quite difficult was on the algebraic Riccati equation. Okay. And that one was hard for a different reason because it is quite math heavy. And like I said, videos don't lend themselves well to just writing out line after line of mathematics and proofs. And I'd started doing that. I wrote a whole script that uses calculus of variations to kind of prove why we're using it in LQR control and all of that stuff. And it was just tedious. <laughs> and I ended up talking to somebody who pointed me to a much simpler, if not less rigorous explanation using completing the square and, and just sort of like doing this algebraic trick to show why it pops up when you're doing these optimal control equations or, you know, solutions. And it worked, I think it worked fine for the video, but those types of explanations that fundamentally are mathematical in nature <laughs> are really hard to put into my format because I don't want to just sit there and go through long proofs. I like to put in drawings and diagrams and build some intuition. And sometimes that intuition is difficult to find if it is just a mathematical one. And perhaps if I knew it better, I'd be able to come up with a good visualization. But since I didn't know it that well, it's like, well, I've got all of this math how can I not tell that particular story? Great. I think it's a great explanation also as to, I mean, sometimes I, I guess one has to live up with the fact that there's also lots of math in our field and that's what we have to deal with. I, I just wanted to move on from now towards basically the evolution also of these videos. You then started lots of different projects that I'm hoping to talk about. So one is a resourcium and then also, I guess, another branch connected to your videos is MATLAB uh, Tech Talks. I guess whether, I don't know, I wonder whether you want to talk about any of these two items. I can probably talk about both of them together because they're sort of interrelated. So about six years ago, I stopped making videos for my channel because MathWorks reached out to me and said, hey, would you like to make videos for us? And I said, that sounds great. I don't have to be all by myself and invent all of these things and hope it's right. Uh, I can have a bunch of experts around me and help make these things a lot better. And I said, sure. So I contracted with them for five years. And then ultimately, as you alluded to in the introduction, I now work for MathWorks full time. And one of my jobs is to make these MATLAB Tech Talk videos, which are explainer videos talking about concepts. They're very, very similar to the videos that were on my channel. It's just uh, now they're branded a little bit differently. And we've got, oh, I don't know, maybe a hundred of those or so. And we're coming out with new ones all the time. 
Now, in the process, like I said, I, I make a lot of videos of topics that I don't understand initially. And so I do a lot of research. And in the process of doing that research, I find just tons of good resources. There's papers and blog posts and other videos and textbooks and Quora answers and all sorts of stuff. It's just like, this is great. I wish that I could tell an introduction in video and then tell people, pause the video right here and go off and download this file and run this thing or go off and read this other person's blog post or pause here. I want to explain something, transfer functions, but this video over here does it really well and it's succinct. Go watch that. But then when you're done, I'm still in the middle of my story. So come back and finish this video. And so I started doing that with links. You know, if you've watched a YouTube video, you've heard people say links are below or like yeah. what you just said here with your podcast, right? Mm -hmm. It's like links to everything are below. And you're hoping that people go down there, the interested ones will go down there and click on something and, and they'll go off and learn. And so I started keeping a list of resources that I thought were particularly interested because people ask me all the time, what do you recommend for the textbooks or what do you recommend here? And I'd send them this list. I mean, like, I got this great list. And then you, you look around the internet and everybody has lists. There's just lists of resources all over the place. And, you know, on um, GitHub, there's the awesome control systems list or something like that. And there's like, there's like 300 links on there of just great resources. And the problem, there, there's a couple of problems I find with just lists is one, they're really hard to know what you're getting yourself into when you click on something. They don't usually have good descriptions of what that's going to take you to. You can't search easily through a pile of 300 links. You can't filter based on what you want through all of that stuff. And everybody everywhere is making lists. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's like, I wanted to find a way to organize, to create a platform where people can make their lists, but also you can search through it, you can filter through it, you can build lists based off of other people's lists. And that's what Resourcium is trying to do. It is a database of links. And each of those links have metadata associated with them based on, you know, their topic, and what type of media it is, and how difficult it is, like what do you need to know. And there's write-ups about each of those resources so that you can see a little tiny snippet of what you're going to get yourself into. And there's a thumbnail for each of those resources, so it looks good. And so there's it's a accumulation of a lot of good resources. That, to me, a list is half of the problem. The other half of the problem is I want to be able to tell people how to consume these resources. Otherwise, I'm leaving it up to them to know what they're searching for. It's that whole searching problem that I talked about on YouTube. People search for PID control because that's what they know. And that's the problem they're trying to solve. But maybe the real problem they're trying to solve is how do I control this particular parameter? And they know PID, so they search for it. So instead of relying on a pile of lists that people have to search and filter through is experts. I'm going to use the word experts loosely. It's just people who have a story to tell and are <laughs> kind of knowledgeable can put together journeys, which are a collection of links that are meant to be consumed in a particular order where you say, this is your end goal. I want to be able to control a parameter here is the journey that I think you should go on. And creating a journey is essentially putting all of these, you know, links in a particular order. And it's hard to explain with by hand gestures that people that are, you know, listening, your audience have no idea what's going on. But it's set up in a way that makes collecting links, ordering links, and then sharing those journeys with other people who want to learn a particular topic. It makes it really easy. And it allows you to start with a blog post, go to a video, go to some software, do some problems and practice exercises, read a, a, a snippet out of a textbook. And it allows you to order, organize all of that stuff nice and neatly. And so that's the end goal of what resourcium.org is. Yeah, as you say, there will be a link to resourcium.org. 
And I guess what you're alluding to is really the problem of, as you say, first having a list of all available resources and then somehow condensing that information or summarizing that information in a particular way so as to have a, a message, a story to go through, essentially. Uh, I found it very interesting as a concept overall. And as you said, so these two things, Resourcium and, and MATLAB Tech Talks are related. I was wondering, since you started both journeys, how has your teaching evolved over time, whether it has changed or whether it has remained the same? Well, my teaching and videos have remained the same because I think those videos fall in a very specific spot in someone's learning journey. My thoughts on what a learning journey looks like, like if I was to put one together on Resourcium, have changed. And the way that I think about it now, and I have a, I have a video on this as well, but the way that I think about it now is that if you're a student, and you could be a student in industry, a student is just, I need to learn this thing. But remember, there's that broad sort of canvassing of everything available. Well, in that broad canvassing, you don't want really deep knowledge on anything. You just want an overview. And so the first thing that I like to create in my learning in these journeys is an introduction to the topic, is what is this topic at a high level? How does it relate to other things around it? Where does it fall in the big picture? Why is it interesting? And, and then you're off and running. Did, was that enough information for you? Maybe. You might have learned that this is not what I'm interested in. Moving on. Or you might have learned, no, this is possibly what I'm interested in. All right, let's move on. So we've got introduction. The second thing is motivation. I'd mentioned earlier that the vast majority of learning, I think, is done like intimately. It's by yourself. It is mulling over textbooks. It's working on problems. It's thinking about it over and over again in your head. And you have to, you have to do all of that in order to form that mental model in your head of what's going on or to practice these steps. And that's a lot of work. And it's no fun if you aren't interested in the topic. It's a chore. And so the second part is motivation. It is, I've got you here. Let me explain why spending all of that time is going to be worthwhile. And that's where I find my videos fit. They're in that introduction and motivate area of this whole journey. It is, you're about to spend a ton of time sitting there working through hard problems, but it's worth it in the end. And maybe I can make it a little bit easier by giving you some sort of framework to think about this problem. So, so then the next thing is I'm motivated. I'm amped up. Let's go. I want to learn this thing. I don't want to sit down and read a textbook then. I'm just too excited. I want to just try it. Give me an example. Give me some hardware. Give me something. I want to attempt what I just learned. I want to try it myself. I want to fail or I want to succeed. Whatever it is, I want to, I want to attempt it. I want to do it right away, whether that's a software example or a hardware example or something. After attempting it, I'm going to learn. Oh, and that was tough at times. I wonder if there's a better way, a more efficient way, if there's a way that I can get better performance out of it, if there's a way that I can understand what I just played around with more intimately. And that's where the learning comes in. You're motivated. You've tried it. You have an understanding of where the pitfalls are. Now let's go and listen to a lecture. Now let's go and read the textbook and get into the nitty gritty because I have this good understanding of the problem and where I can fail and where it can succeed. And so that's the learning point. And uh, learning at this point is consuming information, whether it's from a professor or from a book. Uh, or from another source. That's that consumption. It's coming into you. The next step is to reinforce that. And that comes through practice. Whether it's problems, it's going back to where you attempted it before and doing it a second time and a third time and, and applying what you've learned. But it's that reinforcement of that knowledge that you've learned in order to really get it to stick in your brain. And so then at the end, you're like, I've consolved this problem. I've got it. I've reinforced myself. I'm ready. I'm, I'm quasi expert. What's the next step? And the last step is to explore. So the last step in my learning journeys are, this is the surface that you've scratched on this problem. 
it's always the case. No matter how deep you go, it's always the surface if you think that everything <laughs> is kind of infinite. And so there's always more. Here is where you can go from there. If you are interested and you're motivated, you learned about PID control. Can I tempt you with LQR? Can I tempt you with state space? Can I tempt you with sort of more modern advances in PID control? Can I tempt you with all of these things and give them this landscape of places that they can go from there at the end. And so that's like my new sort of constantly changing thoughts on learning at the moment, which is this six step process of introduction, motivate, attempt, learn, reinforce, and explore. And that's how I try to build my learning journeys on Resourcium. Amazing. I guess there's another one as well. So find a new problem, <laughs> find something else as well to learn. Yes. Yeah. I often find problems. Problems find me. It doesn't take <laughs> much effort. <laughs> yes. I'd like to shift gears now and talk about the, the map of control theory. I have this curiosity. So uh, lots of people might have seen this before. It's a, a map to summarize very brutally, a map that attempts to chart all of control theory uh, visually. Uh, there will be a link in the description, of course. And so I'm, I'm curious about how did this come about? So this started with a YouTube channel called Domain of Science and a YouTuber, Dominic Walliman. And he created the very famous map of mathematics, which kicked off everything. I don't know if you've seen that. It's fantastic. I haven't. <laughs> and he has these sort of mind maps for lots and lots of topics now. He's got computer science and he's got outer space and he has... I don't know, a, a ton of them. He probably has a dozen or so of these maps. But what he doesn't have and didn't have was a map of control theory. And I wrote him and I said, I love these ideas of these maps that you're creating. I want to create one for control theory. Do you mind if I create something in that sort of style? I mean, by style, I just mean it's kind of these cartoon drawings and some titles. Like it looks vastly different than the maps he creates. And he wrote back and said, yeah, of course. Go for it. I think that's awesome. And so that's what kicked it off is I, I liked this idea of organizing all of these different terms that I had heard through education and, and through industry and all of these things of like, oh yeah, block diagrams, yeah, that makes sense. And Coleman filters, that makes sense. And extremum seeking, okay. And I like learned all of these things, but sometimes I was confused as to how does this fit into control theory? Like I'd walk around at work and I'd talk to people and be like, yeah, I'm a control engineer. Oh, cool. What do you do? Oh, I'm working on modeling this actuator. I'm like, uh, okay. And then I'd go and talk to somebody else. Say, oh, I'm a control engineer. What are you doing? And it's, you know, and it's like, oh, I'm, I'm building the system that's fusing together all of these sensors. And every, all of these people that considered themselves control engineers and they were like, not what I had thought of as a controls engineer out of school. And so this map was an attempt to at least place a lot of these main concepts that we talk about in a way that you could point to it and say, I'm working on sliding mode control. It's right over here. It's a type of nonlinear controller control method that you know takes inputs and is trying to drive an output to a specific value. Part of that is state estimation and modeling and simulation and analyzing the system. But I'm working over here right now. And so that was, that was the goal, is to just put together a map that people can point to and say, this is where I focus in the whole grand scheme of things. Also, this is amazing. First of all, I didn't say it before, but I think everybody should see it at least once in their control lifetime. I was curious about how did you decide what should and should not be there? Because I guess one can go on endless uh, boundary drawing and also endless topics could be there. But it's difficult to condense it to the essence. And also, by the way, I did appreciate a lot the fact that centrifugal governor studied by Maxwell was there right at the center. Yeah. Very, very cool. Right at the center. Yeah. Um, it's hard. It's impossible. I think on a 2D plane, it's impossible to categorize all of these concepts accurately and completely. Like, for example, I have a linear topic or subtopic and a nonlinear subtopic. If you were going to classify all of those control methods, they would necessarily fall into one of those two buckets. <laughs> yes. But they don't, because I have the other things. I have robust and adaptive and optimal. And it's like, wait, aren't those linear and nonlinear? 
And it's like, well, yeah, they are, but you have to split them up somehow. And so the way I did it is I took advantage of crowdsourcing and I went to Wikipedia and under Wikipedia, they have, I forgot exactly what it's called. It's not a particular page, but it's like a collection of pages called like control theory. And then they are organized under topics. And that was where I started. And I wrote down all of the ones that I thought were kind of interesting to talk about and how they classified them, whether they said they were part of intelligent control or whether they were part of predictive. And I said, okay, if the majority of the people that edit Wikipedia think that this is a good way to organize and to classify these topics, I'm going to run with that. And then I put out a draft version online. And if the internet is good for one thing, it's getting feedback from anonymous strangers about your work. And I got tons of feedback. Oh, this is missing. You should move this over here. And I loved it all, honestly, because that's how you make something better. And so I, I collected all of that and I put out a second draft. And that's what is the one that most people see now, which is after, you know, after some tweaks and stuff from the internet. And it still has, not problems, but it still is confusing to me. Like, well, I've, I've got a question for you, um, Alberto, is I have under linear full state feedback, but then I have under optimal LQR. How would you classify those two things as being separate or the same or justify calling them out separately? <laughs> As you say, it should be in different dimensions somehow. It should be 3D or 4D, 5D, but it's difficult. So if you have to project it on a 2D plane, you have to choose. And in fact, you highlighted before the first distinction, you know, due to my background for me, it was like, how can you say that something is linear or non-linear? The whole thing, the whole map should be <laughs> classified into one or another. But I think I don't know, personally, at least also based on the interactions that I had about this map with other people and also with so-called experts, the role of this map is really also to uh, generate discussion. What is missing? What is the most important block? Where do I locate in this map? And this is also the reason why I think having this map is fantastic, personally. I agree completely. Like I, I like the idea of it being a little bit controversial because because of that, it drives those discussions. Like I have discussions with people when I go to conferences about various things about it. And I learned something and, and I'm hoping other people are having conversations that say like, ah, that's not really where this belongs. And I wish there was a way that made it easy for me to make changes that I agree with. Like crowdsourcing is nice, but I, I, like, I like the idea of it being filtered through one sort of moderator, which is me. <laughs> um, and right now I get, you know, random comments here and there on it. And I kind of mull it over and I've got a collection of a few things that I want to change in the future. But, but I like the idea of people discussing it. And in fact, I've made two other maps now with a team at MathWorks. We have, and all of them are available on my website. They send you to MathWorks.com. But one's on modeling dynamic systems map. And then just last week, one came out on feedback control systems, a map. And I organized it differently there than I did in my map of control. On the left-hand side are what we're calling traditional methods, like PID and MPC and frequency domain, state feedback and stuff. On the right-hand side are data-driven and AI methods, like fuzzy inference systems and MRAC and reinforcement learning and extreme seeking. And then at the top we split it up to be, this is a controller method or an or kind of an architecture. And that's where state feedback lives. State feedback is an architecture. You're going to take all of those states, you're going to feed them back and through a gain matrix, and that's the architecture. How do you come up with those gains? You come up with those gains through tuning methods. You could do that through pole placement, or you could do it through LQR or other means. And so the top are controller methods or, or architectures, and the bottom is various ways that we tune control controllers. And again, this one's not perfect either because it's a 2D plane and it has its own problems, but it'll generate a new set of discussions and a new way of thinking about, you know, how to organize feedback control systems into something that allows you to get some sort of information 
out of it. Like I'm hoping there's value in these maps still, even though I'm just kind of like reordering them in, in slightly different ways, but maybe they'll generate new interest or new intuition or new questions. There will be, of course, links in the description about these new maps. First, I'd like to comment on what you just said. I did love the last map that you put out there, feedback control systems with MATLAB and Simulink. And what I loved about it was the distinction between methods and tuning, because tuning is actually the untold story of control design. Uh, they teach us all these methods about how to make a plan to whatever we want, but then nobody tells you how you should, you know, find the best gains or fi I mean, obviously there are methodologies and I guess what I'm trying to say is that the hardest time for a control engineer out there is really making things work <laughs> somehow. So I really like the emphasis on that in this second map. From here, I thought about linking towards, well, your drawing abilities, comics, <laughs> because we are talking about the map. The map is a pictorial representation of the landscape of control theory. As we said, also throughout these videos, your videos and, and also in your book that I hope we'll cover as well, you have cartoons all over the place. So <laughs> I, I guess the first question I have is, were you naturally gifted in drawing or uh, is something that came out with time and how did you end up also writing comics for the IFAC newsletter, <laughs> which personally I enjoy a lot? <laughs> oh, good, good. I appreciate that. I, I don't think there's any natural ability. There's just a natural interest in art. I've always did a lot of art growing up. I did oil painting for a long time and I always have to do something a little bit creative and the videos were creative and I thought I'm going to find a way to sort of combine these two things that I really like. Plus, I find the cartoons and the comics and the drawings and stuff takes a little bit of the edge of professionalism off of these videos, it like sort of lowers the barrier into uh, somebody coming and watching it and being like, oh, this is some serious stuff. I better buckle down and think about it. And it's like, ah, it's not that serious. It's fun. It's mo interesting. It's it can be made, hopefully, just as interesting as any other thing that you want to you know, that you're interested in sports or whatever, you know, whatever it is that draws your attention. Control theory can be that. It's an exciting field with a lot of interesting problems that you can solve. And I just found that drawings sort of lightened the mood a little bit. And it was something I enjoyed doing. And between the videos and the map, Dr. Moritz uh, schultz Durup from Dortmund University, he was tasked with refreshing the IFAC newsletter and he reached out to me and just said, hey, crazy ask, but we were trying to put together this sort of Venn diagram of people who know controls and people who can draw. And you were one of the few that we thought of in the middle. Would you like to make comics? We wanted to sort of revive the control comics that I think it was the IEEE magazine had back in the 80s and 90s that were all, all fantastic. Would you be interested? I said, I've never considered that. I will give it a shot and we'll keep going until you fire me <laughs> because it's not working out anymore. And it's been going on, I don't know, two years or so now. I'm not really sure how long it's been. It's only once every two months I create a comic and they are created with much pain and suffering <laughs> because I don't feel like I'm naturally funny. <laughs> and I sit in my office and I like think it's so much harder than making videos because I'm thinking, okay, I want to make a comic on this topic. How's that funny? And I go to like chat GPT and it's like terrible. It doesn't know humor whatsoever. And so it, what I end up doing is I, I create something that doesn't have a punchline and I just email all of my colleagues, like Steve Brunton's on the list. I always email Steve Brunton. I say, Steve, what would you do differently here? And he always has good ideas. And, and people that I work with at MathWorks, they always have good ideas. And then I just make changes and I try to tweak them. So anybody, all of your audience, everybody listening, if you've been sitting on a great controls joke that maybe you tell your class and you said, oh, I wish Brian would draw this up and share this with the IFAC community. I'm all for it. Send me an email. <laughs> this is wonderful. My personal favorite is the one about second order response curves when you have three curves, an overdamp, an underdamp, and simply a damp. <laughs> you say, it turns out settling time depends on the dynamics of the system and ink viscosity. <laughs> I personally really enjoy your comics and I like look forward to seeing the next one in an IFAC newsletter. 
Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I just finished one for, I think it's the April newsletter that I actually like quite a bit. <laughs> sometimes sometimes they're just like, oh, good, I'm glad I finished. <laughs> I don't know if it's funny anymore because I thought about it too much. But the next one for April, I quite like. I always chuckle every time I read it now. So I'm hoping everybody enjoys this one too. The other comment I have relates to the geographical nature of whoever is both a good control communicator. Why are you mentioned Steve Branton? So I'm wondering why are you all located in such a small geographical area? <laughs> what is it so special about that? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, Steve is at the University of Washington, which is 15 minutes down the road from me. I get to, I, I'm lucky that he's so close. I get to chat with him and we meet up couple times a year and we keep meaning to do a video together and it's just has not worked out yet but we talk about it all the time i'm very much looking forward to that maybe actually now it's a good time to shift gears and talk about the book that i mentioned also earlier it's something that i wanted to talk about you've written a book about control theory i forget the title if i have to be honest it's introduction to control theory or fundamentals of control theory yes the it's fundamentals yeah and, and also there, I mean, your style continues to be very much transparent. So it's quite a unique book. And I do recommend it to people because, first of all, you see lots of cartoons throughout the book. So as you say, it lowers the pressure somehow. You're not fastening your belt for some hardcore mathematics, but you're actually, you know, enjoying almost a written conversation, if you wish. And I like the principles behind it. So providing an intuitive understanding updating the book frequently, as you say in your introduction, and allow the readers to participate in improving the book on top of being making it as inexpensive as possible. So I'm wondering how did this all come about as well? What's the genesis of this book? Um, I don't know exactly what the genesis was. The book was an experiment. I never really wanted to write a book, but I had this idea of how a book could be, and I wanted to try it out. And the idea was that I wanted to treat a book like software, where software is constantly continual integration of software. It's constantly being changed. There's a change log with each new revision of the software and distribution to people who already have it is near automatic and feedback in terms of writing tickets against the software already there's an ecosystem for that where you have bugs and all of that kind of stuff. And I thought I wanted to try that with a textbook and see, or just a book and see if it would work. And so the whole thing is written in LaTeX and it's managed in Git. And I have, well, I had, this is the, the experiment kind of ran its course and it's kind of died down here now, but I had a Jira system in place where anybody could write tickets against the book. And so I would get all of these tickets in whenever I'd send out a new version of it. People would write tickets on errors in the book, confusing sections, places where I could talk about something else that I didn't cover. It was that sort of crowdsourcing the ideas, but through this kind of formal method of tickets. And the reason why that was nice is because I could address those tickets, make the changes in the book, I could save the book revision in Git. I could close all of those tickets against a particular revision of the book, send out a new revision, and the change log comes for free because it is just, here are all of the tickets that I addressed in this particular book. And I would create my own for new sections that I wanted to write. Then if you happen to come across an older version of the book and you wanted to know what the errata was or something like that, you could just go to Jira and say, I've got this version and it would come up with, these were all of the tickets that were written against that particular version and how they were addressed. But the idea was that I hope nobody was using an old version because the book is free and it's free to download and you can always just get the newest version. There wasn't any sort of reason not to be on the newest one. And I used the book as a way to sort of think about, I remember I said at the beginning here that I don't have the responsibility of a complete lecture when I make my videos, I'm picking and choosing. And the book was sort of a challenge to myself to see if I did have to create a complete lecture, what would that look like? And how would I go about explaining this topic? If I felt like at the end, I really wanted somebody to be able to have a good grasp of control engineering, at least at a fundamental, you know, sort of first controls course level. 
So with all that being said, the book is still there. The first three, four chapters, I can't remember. And it's free. You can just download it off my website and you can take a look at it. It it is unfortunately fallen to the wayside in terms of like updates, but it is still available. I'm still happy with the way that the first couple of chapters came out. There's a lot of drawings. There's a lot of, you know, like we talked about already. I think it's a good, gentle introduction to what could be some really heavy topics in terms of understanding them. And, you know, if you're interested, go take a look at it and maybe one day I'll pick it back up again. But in hindsight, I really liked that interface with the audience and the quick turn on the revisions. It worked out really well and it was nice. I think the concept is great. Also, as I said, the book is interspersed with comics on they're all over the place. And it's nice because you often plug in numbers into equations that builds a lot of intuition. And as you said, it's also very fun to read, like due to the fact that it's a bit more light. I don't know, somehow you manage to remove all the seriousness feeling of a controlled textbook, that <laughs> a, a normal controlled textbook, let's put it that way. <laughs> For example, I, I was reading the preface and you thank the reader, you go like, now before you proceed any further, I want to thank you for reading this book. And then there's a footnote and the preface. Who reads the preface anyways? <laughs> and the, the whole book is actually interspersed with these kind of comments, which, you know, they I feel they contribute to releasing the pressure. Yeah, so everything interesting that I've done, I, I've taken from other people. Like, so my videos are based on Khan Academy. My comics, at least my early ones, were based on the style of XKCD. Are you familiar with the webcomic XKCD? Yes, okay, I, I personally adopt them. And Randall Monroe, who writes that, had a blog, and he still keeps it up occasionally, called What If?, where somebody would write in some silly question of like, you know, what if I threw a baseball at 0.9 the speed of light or something, what would happen? And he just uses like real world physics and just explains it. And every single, and he does it with images and he just has tons of footnotes throughout his what if blog post. And his footnotes are always just funny takes on things that if you wrote it in the actual like blog, it would take you away from it because you, you know, maybe you just want to actually like read the story. But then you can go back and they're like little Easter eggs. You can go back and read all of the footnotes. And I thought, oh, that's a fun idea. I'm going to try that with mine and just see if it works out. It was a lot more fun for me too, because I'd come up with something and I'm like, oh, I want to write this, but I don't want to write it in the main text. So I'll just stick it in a footnote. Something that I want to highlight also about the book is in the end. So then in the final chapter uh, where you talk about model-based design, you have a specific section where you say essentially, if you've never participated in a large scale engineering effort, you might not understand what is meant by the last sentence. And the last sentence is really a comparison between model-based design, the use of models versus real hardware prototypes and physical mockups. And I, I don't know, I was trying to think about other examples of books that give that type of engineering life cycle example, and I couldn't find, and it's something that I would have wanted to see in other textbooks. So I thought it was very nice to have this perspective of, you know, in the real world, we actually use control theory and we're going to use it in this way. Let me give you a preview of how the world looks like. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. That was the goal is what I wanted to do. And now I'm just feeling bad that I never completed it. But <laughs> no. what I wanted to do is build up a problem that we could take from concept, like initialization and requirements and sizing of actuators and, you know, performance requirements and stuff, and take that all the way up through design, test, deployment, all the way. And with a focus on control theory, so don't go off in the weeds on too many things, but just nods to all of these different problems that typically in this stage of your design, these are the other problems, peripheral problems that you're going to be exposed to. We're not going to talk about that because I'm trying to stay focused, but Keep in mind that at this stage, what we're talking about here, the problems that you're most concerned with as a controls engineer, the rest of the program is also going through problems. And these are the problems that they're dealing with, and they may overlap with yours. And I wanted to sort of call that out because I liked that kind of practical approach to learning for me, because I never did research. So I never went in, got my PhD and, and do research. My, all of my education was geared specifically towards like solving an engineering problem. And so that was the way that my sort of brain went when I was writing this book is for those that are going to go off and in, into industry and design a system, 
here are the peripheral problems that are being solved at the same time so that you're aware of it. It's wonderful that you touch on control theory in the wild because here I have a couple of questions. So one is personal, if you wish, and again, another one is of a pedagogical nature. So the first one is related to your experience. You obviously had enormous experience in practical control projects. And I was wondering what was the most challenging for you or in general, also the most interesting, if you wish. And the other one is related to what would be instead the most instructive project or example that everyone should go through in learning controls. I personally faced this question last year, helping co-design a course here at ETH. And luckily, Elon Musk seems to make wonderful advertisement of our field indirectly lately with everything, basically autonomous cars, reusable rockets, humanoids. So we have something to talk about that is, let's say, interesting for the new generations. But I'm curious about your perspective. Yeah, for me, you know, what I, what I thought was odd when I joined industry from academia is, or from my undergrad studies, I guess, and grad studies is how little controller design and tuning I ultimately did. And it was exciting and fun to do that sort of thing. But I found that it was all of the other problems that were really challenging and interesting, like state machines and fault detection and fault responses. Like I, w everything's working great. I've tuned my controller. This is great. What happens if we lose a sensor? What happens if we lose an actuator? What happens if one of the sensors is out of range? What happens if messaging slows down between these two compute elements? All of these like what if <laughs> problems that would pop up. How do you want to respond to that? How do you want to detect it? And then how do you want to respond to it? Because I, like I said, I've worked on satellites and the easiest thing is if anything goes wrong, go into safe mode. And safe mode is essentially turn off everything that's not critical, keep power generation on and keep communication, you know, beaconing and everything else shuts down until you figure it out. And he's like, well, that's not really a good solution for everything because that is downtime on the platform and whatever it is that you're using it for is no longer going to be, you know, doing things of value. And so you want to minimize the amount of time you're going into like the lowest grade mode. And so it was coming up with all of that fault logic. And the hardest thing for me was state of charge on our lithium ion batteries that are getting hot and cold and heavy items like the way that we did, um, the way that we would do attitude control is with reaction wheels, which are a motor with a really kind of high inertia flywheel attached to it. And so when you torque that wheel, you get that opposite torque, the bus or the body of the spacecraft moves in the opposite direction. And those would sometimes, if you're going to do a, a large slew from one, from one attitude to another, would take a lot of power. That power would then droop the voltage on the power line, which would then go through, you know, potentially our state of charge estimator. And it would say, oh, the state of charge went down instantly on the battery. And do we want to respond to that? So like I learned over time that like naively just saying if state of charge is below 30%, do this thing doesn't work in every situation. And so you just start finding all of these situations under which what you thought was a really simple fault detection and fault response system just starts failing and breaking down. And that's where I spent the vast majority of my time, not in nominal operations, where everything's working great, design this controller, that was easy. But it was, how do you want to handle when things aren't right and what could go wrong? And doing all of that stuff, which was really fun to think about because I hadn't really considered it before, but also very challenging because every project is unique. And so with that, with, uh, I, I forgot your second question exactly, but it was along the lines of, I vaguely remember thinking of an answer when you asked it. So <laughs> let me just tell my answer and see if it's in line with your question. <laughs> Controls is, I think, intimately tied to software and intimately tied to electronics really closely. And understanding that a lot of the problems that you're going to solve are going to be software-related problems of timing and messaging and 
sequence diagrams and just the weirdness that can happen when when you're not working in an environment where things take time and things can break. Um, and then understanding the software side of things is really important. And then similarly, most things with all of these, you know, like you said, autonomous vehicles and spaceship and stuff that can land themselves, everything is running on some sort of circuit board. And circuit boards have their own set of electronics, have their own set of problems with electromagnetic interferences and, and you know, just things of that nature that I found myself, other than on doing fault tests and fault responses, was learning to troubleshoot software and learning to troubleshoot electronics was a large portion of what I ended up having to do to ensure that my control system was going to work. I loved your answer. I guess I have two comments here too. So the first one is related to the first part of your answer. So I could summarize it as the difficulty of autonomy is the environment in a certain sense. So designing the controller somehow is the easy part and then stuff happens and you need to understand, figure out how to react. The second element that I wanted to touch on was related to, let's say, quote unquote, the most instructive example of all. So normally, I guess the most representative example that control educators give is the infamous or famous inverted pendulum on a cart. We're trying to have this inverted pendulum straight up. So last year, uh, we went through this exercise here at ETH um, when designing this course called uh, Computational Control of what should be the running example. And initially we said, okay, the inverted pendulum or a motor, control the position of a motor. But then we thought, why don't we give the students something a bit more exciting, something that, you know, sparks their interest beyond the inverted pendulum. And so in the end, we converged on a reusable space rocket with videos and stuff also all done in with Python collabs, uh, we would try to be very innovative. And I was wondering whether, is there any better example or anything, or should these examples evolve with time, I guess? That's, I don't know, probably vaguely my question in this regard. Well, I think they should definitely evolve in time. I mean, you have to sort of capture the zeitgeist of what's going on, and that's what students are most interested in. So, you know, I think the landing of a rocket is a great problem. I think you can make any problem be practical, even the inverted pendulum can be a very practical problem. I don't know if this is a good advertisement for Kwanzer or not, but uh, they have their cube servo too, which is this like rotary inverted pendulum. And I have one and I thought, ah, this is going to be like my college experience where I just plug in some values and it's going to work. And it wasn't that at all. And again, this is a good advertise for them. It's not going to feel that way. But there was enough like friction in the, uh, in the arm and there was enough like noise on the sensor and there's like a cable that runs up to the pendulum and that adds torque. All sorts of problems that every time I make a video using it, I'm solving all of these peripheral problems and I'm thinking, this is great. This is honestly great because it isn't just plug and play. There are some really interesting problems that you can set up when the hardware and the software aren't overpowered for the problem that you're looking for, that you're right in that region where it works, but getting it to work is going to require some ingenuity and some problem solving. Now, it might not necessarily be as exciting as trying to land a rocket, but you can make any problem practical and have that sort of broader value to it by, you know, by setting it up a certain way. I don't know what environment you use to do the inverted or the, um, the rocket landing, but like with Kerbal Space Program, which is a fun game, they have a way of there's an API there that allows you to write code for it. And you can write your own code and have it simulated in this physics environment, you know, to do automatic path following of a rocket or path following of a satellite or even trying to land it. I think there's people that try to do that. And so any problem I think that is current, you know, you want to try to solve problems that are in the news because people are excited about it and set it up in such a way that it requires a little bit of ingenuity to get to the answer. I think is fantastic. That's how I would like to learn anyway. Give me a problem that's current, make me use some of my brain to figure it out. I don't wanna just plug in numbers. And that's exactly the thought process we went through. I'm taking notes, by the way, as you speak for our next version of this course. I think in the end we settled on the gym physics environment, but I'll look up what you just mentioned. <laughs> so I guess we're now shifting towards the end of the episode. 
there's usually a couple of questions that I tend to ask to our guests. The first question I have relates to the future because I always like to give some perspective. And with you, I'd like to give some perspective about the future of control education. You mentioned that you were recently, I guess, a couple of years back, keynote speaker at ECE, the Advancers in Control Education Conference. We mentioned also earlier that there's lots of technological advances in general in the field of content creation. We have lots of new media. We mentioned YouTube videos today, cartoons, lightboards uh, with uh, championed by you, but also Steve Branton, I guess. Blogs, I personally like Ben Recht's blog a lot, Maxim Raginsky, another one. This podcast is also a new medium, if you wish, for controls people. So where are we heading? And yeah, what are your thoughts? So I think the vast majority, I think, of what people were talking about at the advancements in control education was around the idea of virtual labs, remote labs, and um, like take-home labs type of thing, and like applications and stuff like that, is giving students that kind of hands-on ability to fiddle with knobs and change things and, and learn from that perspective, which I think is great. I, I make a lot of apps for my video and then I share them. And I think if I'd learned using apps, I would be really, you know, excited about doing that sort of thing. One thing I will say for me is like, you know, or for everybody, I suppose, is like the future is hard to predict. And, you know, I don't know, 10 years ago, everything was reinforcement learning and it was all over everywhere. And I was like, oh, this is cool. I'm going to learn this and it's going to be great. And now everything is like generative AI and where everybody's like, oh, how do we fit this into controls and stuff? And I don't, I don't know what's coming next. I don't know what's going to be, what's going to stick and what isn't. But the thing that I would like people to focus on is being able to reason through a problem. And I'll explain what I mean by that is like, you have to do the math, but at the end of the day, the math is going to give you an answer. And if you trust the process, then the math, then the answer is going to be correct. But if you have some way to sort of reason to that same order of magnitude on that answer, you have a secondary check on whether what, what you did was correct or not. And for example, like tuning a PID controller. PID is inherently awesome because of its intuitive nature. It makes sense what the proportional gain does. It makes sense what the derivative gain does and what the integral gain does. You can kind of reason through it. But I never learned any of that reasoning other than the rules of thumb. Oh, if you rise time, you want to increase rise time, increase proportional. You've got overshoot, increase derivative. You've got steady state error, increase integral or add integral. And I'm like, okay, that kind of makes sense. But I felt like it was like rules of thumb in one level abstracted. And so the way I like to talk to people about PID control at the beginning is here, I'll ask you actually, Alberto, here I'll <laughs> use you and then the audience, if you're, you can play along as well. Let's make a really simple system. We have a heater and it can go from zero to a hundred. And you have a temperature sensor near it. And there's a thermal mass in between. And the temperature sensor comes back with whatever temperature it reads. And you want to control the temperature of that thermal mass to let's say 50 degrees C with a PID controller. Do you need an integral term? Oh my God. <laughs> like, do you need one? Not, not would it be nice to have? Is it required? <laughs> and I'll, 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 I won't put you on the spot here. So the way, the way I like to think about this is let's assume the control system is working perfectly. Mm -hmm. There is zero error, and there has been zero error for a long time. What is the proportional path doing with zero error? Nothing. Nothing. What is the derivative path doing with zero error for a long time? Nothing. Nothing. If you don't have an integral term, the output of your controller is going to be zero. Are you okay with that? Is it going to, are you at some sort of steady state environment where a zero output from the controller is exactly what you want when there's zero error. And in this case, probably not, because unless the environment is 50 degrees, it's going to start to move. And now you're going to have some error. And so at steady state, when the controller is working perfectly, you need an integral term if you need the output of the controller to be some biased value 
to hold the error to zero. And that's all the integral is doing is over time, it's summing up the error until it gets to that perfect value that's going to hold the error to zero while the proportional and the derivative path are doing nothing whatsoever. And, and it was that sort of thing where I was like, uh, that would have been helpful for me to kind of like understand when I'm choosing a PI and D control. Now, the integral term is going to allow you to craft a better response and, and all that sort of thing. But whether you absolutely need one or not, it's not it gets rid of steady state error, which it does in certain systems. But the reason for that steady state error is because the proportional and the derivative path do nothing if the error is zero for a long time. So it's that sort of explanation that I'd like to see you know, that I'm trying to do in my videos, but that would have helped me just a ton. And then before getting into the math that I'd like to see people focus on, at least in the undergrad level. So I guess what you mean by seeing people reason through problems is really adding lots of if something, then lots of if else, essentially enriching the understanding. So once we have a methodology. Yeah, it's it's just coming up with a way to guess at the answer ahead of time so that you know whether the approach you're taking is in line with what you thought. Because if it isn't, it's either because your intuition about the problem was vastly off, in which case, great, let's get that corrected, or you approached the problem incorrectly mathematically, in which case, great, we need to do something about that and fix it. Another example with PID control is I give you that exact same system and I say, tune the PID controller. What do you put for proportional gain? Where do you start? We don't have a model of the system, so model-based tuning is out. Let's just say one. Is it too naive? Let's just say one. I'm glad you said that because <laughs> everybody starts that. Let's just start with one and go from there. That's what I used to do. But then let's assume that the output to the heater is a duty cycle between zero and one. What is the maximum amount of error that this system could see. I'm trying to drive it to 50 degrees C. It's in my living room, this example. Maybe if it's a bad day, it's 10 degrees. So the maximum delta could be a 40 degree delta. That's the maximum error I'm gonna be able to see. That error is gonna go through, it's gonna be multiplied by a proportional gain and the output better be between zero and one <laughs> because otherwise I'm saturating my controller yeah. and, and I'm no longer linear. So if you put a one in there, you're going to get a 40 out. It's going to get saturated instantly and it'll work, right? Because that's the beauty of PID. It's going to work, but it's just going to be pegged at full heat until it gets close enough to where it can get back down into that linear range. And so if you are trying to keep your controller linear, it better be a lot smaller than one. <laughs> yes. And you can kind of, you know, reason through like kind of like that first principles of what, what should I start with? so that I'm not hunting forever, right? You can use a little bit of that reasoning. Anyway, that's, that, I guess that's what I'm getting at. It's just, how do you know whether you're in the right ballpark or not? And thinking about problems from that sort of reasoning perspective and the mathematical perspective so that you, you hone in together. I can feel Richard Hemming echoing here. The purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. I guess now we really are at the end of the episode. Last question I tend to ask to every guest is advice to future students. So you probably know the question already. What kind of advice would you give to somebody who's just come to the area or are planning to stay in the area for longer? I was thinking about this and I kind of molded over for a little bit. And I think what I, it boils down to for me and what I think could be helpful for other people is Learn what is interesting to you. If you're into controls, you've chosen a wonderful field because it is so vast that you can apply it to almost any problem and to almost any discipline and to almost any field. And you may not start there. Your first research project might not be exactly what you're 100% interested in. It might you, your first job might not be exactly what you're interested in, but careers are long and you sort of meander through your career and you get choices that are presented to you and you can move into new things. And 
even now as like students or at any point, if you are learning what is interesting to you, like you're into electronics, study electronics, you're into cars, study more about cars, go drive your car, figure out that sort of thing. You know, like, how does it work? If you're into sports, if you're into art, if you're into music, like I was into art, you know, you can then almost certainly over the course of your career, find a way to apply that knowledge in some way. And if nothing else, you'll be able to make decisions as to where to go with your career as you move forward based on these other interesting things that, or these other things that you find interesting. And I found that almost everything I've learned, I have found a way eventually to apply it to my job because it's something that I know. I like shoehorn it in. It's like, oh, I know this thing. I read this book. Maybe we should try this or, or whatever it is. And so learning what is interesting to you, don't, you don't necessarily have to be hyper-focused on, I just need to only do controls. I want to be a controls person because controls touches everything and is everywhere. And so learning things outside of controls will only help you be a better controls engineer throughout your career. Well, on this positive note, uh, Brian, I will thank you for joining the show. It's been a real pleasure to have you here. Oh, it was, it was my pleasure and an honor to be asked. I appreciate it. Had fun. Thank you for listening. I hope you liked the show today. If you enjoyed the podcast, please consider giving us five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow us on Spotify, support on Patreon or PayPal, and connect with us on social media platforms. See you next time. <laughs>